Okay, so this is the January 29th, 2020 meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council. We have a quorum, so I am calling it to order at 8.33 a.m. Um, before we take general public comment, I'm gonna just jump to number six announcements to get that over with while we wait for one more member to show up, and that is just that there is a Community Resources Committee retreat scheduled for this coming Monday, February 3rd at, um, I think we're 6.30 p.m. at right here in the town room. Um, the, that agenda is already posted online. Um, the packet will be posted later this week, um, probably sometime tomorrow for that. Um, so anyone's welcome to attend. There will be no public comment at that meeting because it is a retreat and our standard operating is that the retreats are for internal discussions um, made in public. Uh, does anyone else have any announcements? Not seeing any. So uh, is there any, our next item of agenda, agenda item is general, oh, I forgot to say we are recording this. So um, for those out there um, that is being recorded by the town. So anyone in the audience would like to make general public comment. We do not have scheduled any public comment specifically on any of the action items. As chair, I reserve the right to add that in as necessary because I know we have people who are directly associated with some of those items in the audience. But is there any general public at this time? Any general public comment at this time? Seeing none, that moves us on to our action items. The first action item is the draft affordable housing priorities policy. Um, this was a, and here comes Dorothy. So as I give the introduction, she'll be able to get herself set. Um, back in November, the community resources committee wrote a memo to the town council on our feedback as per our referral from the town council to look at the housing priorities plan and produce some potential feedback so that the council could send that feedback back to the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust. Um, we did that in November. Finance Committee has been working on it since that time to produce their feedback because they had a referral to and in light of what the Finance Committee has produced in their report and their feedback, I have put this back on our agenda to discuss whether we would like to add anything to our feedback before the Council as a whole discusses this. So I'm gonna pass this over, at least for introduction, a little bit to the Chair of the Finance Committee, who happens to also sit on CRC, to talk about um, what the Finance Committee recommendation is and why that might be relevant to why we're on back on the agenda here. So Andy. Okay. Um, the Finance Committee draft report that was uh, submitted for consideration by the Finance Committee is in the packet for today's CRC meeting. And uh, the reason that I wanted to start there is because the recommendation at the um, conclusion of the report is not um, changed by the discussion yesterday. It was ad um, adopted unanimously um, in a vote of the Finance Committee. Um, the resident members of the committee were supportive of the action. Um, we always um, ask them for um, comments that they may have to offer before um, we take up a vote because they are non-voting members. Um, there were some changes that were made um, in the report. Um, they're more about um, some of the, um, just uh, a few of the points, not very many, and uh, conclusions. I think that the most significant one that I wanted to make sure gets noted is that uh, after discussion and after input from uh, the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust, who's here also today, Mr. Hornick, uh, we wanted to make a little bit of a stronger statement about um, the fact that uh, at times um, when the town 
puts funding behind a proposal, um, it is um, a generator of money from state grants and that the uh, money that is received from the uh, state is not really recognized in some in the calculations that have been put put forward by the planning department so that uh, we wanted to make sure that that was recognized. That's a decision that gets made on a case-by-case -case basis depending upon eligibility and something that uh, regardless of what we do, I think that is, is, um, is a policy that will always be there because um, it is the logical thing to do and the best example I can give to you um, is what we already know is happening with uh, Valley CDC's effort um, to develop um, a project at 132 Northampton Road and that uh, the step that they're now engaged in is to seek state funding, which is an integral part of their funding package. And uh, so we strengthened that point um, for very deliberate purposes. Another thing that um, we wanted to um, emphasize a little bit more strongly than was in there before is a point that Ms. Pam has raised in both committees, and that is that there are a number of strategies that um, can be pursued that will generate more affordable housing that uh, are things that are really like zoning changes um, that we've talked about and things that do not have direct cost but um, to the town uh, but can be productive of housing and can be economically feasible in, uh, in that they will not discourage but, um, housing from being built but take advantage of housing that's being built. So we wanted to strengthen um, those points. But the bottom line um, recommendation is that um, we feel that um, the question of uh, the goal needs to be considered very carefully. Um, we're in no way uh, suggesting that a goal is in an, in, an inappropriate strategy, uh, but that uh, it needs to have um, a little bit more thought given behind the goal. Um, there was, there's a lot of feeling in the Finance Committee members that it sh um, the housing policy should be a policy of the Town Council and should cover um, more than just um, housing for people who are uh, below 80% of um, AMI, but cover a broader range, um, which is not to say that 80 people below 80% is not an important element of what we're doing, but it should be a broader policy. And to recommend that uh, two things, that the policy be um, referred from the council back to a committee, um, and we also said specifically that it probably should not be the Finance Committee um, to develop um, a, a final policy for council consideration before adoption, and suggested that that possibly could be this committee, um, the Community Resources Committee. Um, the other thing, another suggestion that we made is that any policy of number um, should have explicit flexibility for the council to reconsider the um, it, as it considers each proposal as to um, and not let ourselves be bound by the, um, the goal. The goal is important, but the, uh, the ability to revisit is um, on an ongoing basis is important for the council to have. So um, that's basically what is there. Um, as I said, the conclusion at the end is therefore not really changed at all. And it has now been adopted and we will do the final edits based upon the conversation at yesterday's meeting and then get it off to the council, hopefully before the next council meeting. 
Thank you. Um, so with that summary, I think that gives us a little idea of why it's back here, which is there is a recommendation in the fi from the Finance Committee that will be going to the Council of that um, the policy should be developed by the Council, a broader policy, um, and that potentially that referral to develop that would come back here. So before the Council decides as chair of this committee, I thought it might be wise for us to be able to talk as a committee about that at the council level. Um, so I thought we could come back and revisit our response to the referral, which really just dealt with our concerns and feedback on the policy itself, not the process for redoing or revising that potential policy and where that might sit. So I'd like our discussion initially to, to sort of focus on, um, we had some of this in the prior document, but to focus on should we as a council or we as a committee at this point recommend a broader housing policy adoption instead of one focused solely on ADA, AMI, and lower. Um, and, and beyond that, um, where should that policy be developed? And so those are sort of the questions I think we should discuss first. So I'd love to hear any feedback. We have two finance committee members sitting here too, so we've kind of heard some of that through the report from the Finance Committee, but it would be good to hear it from a CRC view, because you can always look at things differently. Dorothy. Well, I think that Andy has summed up our discussion quite well, and um, I'll also add that um, he, he pointed out, if we count the, um, I know actually it was, it was uh, Mr. Hornick who pointed out that if you look at what we ha are doing and what's in the pipeline, that we have already are making progress towards the goal, which I believe it was um, the number of units within five to 10 years. Uh, so I, I think that we are very supportive of affordable housing. We uh, are faced with reading about the housing problem all the time, but I do agree that I'd like to fold it into a larger, more comprehensive housing policy, which the whole town council would get behind. Um, and, um, so I, I guess uh, Mandy Jo's suggestion is that the CRC um, form this into a, um, uh, I guess a request for further discussion with the town council, um, perhaps the president, and, and uh, I'm not quite sure. There was a mention of a committee that has not yet been formed. So I'd like to ask you about that a little bit. So, I, uh, Pat, Pat first, and then I'll, okay. Um, I was gonna respond to two things. The first one was um, my request for the conversation today. I think the conversation today is, do we want to modify any of our recommendations or portions of vote back to the council mm -hmm. regarding the referral, um, including similar things to what the Finance Committee put into their recommendations. Um, to respond to your other one, there is a policy from, G a proposal from GOL um, that's been introduced initially to the council for a committee reorganization. Um, if that passes, the Community Resources Committee would retain under that proposal housing and master plan and planning and development um, land use. The new sort of renamed committee, Town Services and Organization or Outreach, um, would, would receive from the CRC charge more of the public um, works, public safety, transportation, um, you know, busing, bus services, and, and that type of services. So housing would stay with the committee that is here today. Pat. I actually would like to hear from John Hornick uh, in response to the question that's been put out to us about a larger policy. John, would you like to respond to that? As a, you're, you're still chair of the Affordable Housing Trust, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that hasn't changed. <laughs> so John is our the chair of the Amherst Affordable Housing. Amher there's an A M municipal. I was like, there's an M in there. Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust in town. Is your is your mic on? Sorry. Oh, there we go. 
Uh, so we are the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust, therefore we offered a, an affordable housing policy and asked you to act on that. Now, as I look at the larger problem, which has to be acknowledged, we didn't av avoid it entirely. We do have some language on 80 to 100 percent that's also acknowledged by the Finance Committee. But when you go above 100 percent, there are no immediate or obvious or easy solutions. Plus, as I said, it was really beyond the scope of what the Housing Trust is uh, intended to work on. As I think about the problem, it involves things like speaking to the university uh, about adding several thousand more student residential units on campus. I think that's what you need to change the marketplace in Amherst because we, I think there's an estimate out there of something like four to 5,000 students living in housing in Amherst. Some of it obviously is specially built for them and what I would imagine the university doing in its newest construction and in future construction is also building housing that would be more attractive to students perhaps than what's now offered on campus. But my point is that's one possible solution for the larger housing problem. Others involve uh, uh, rent control, which comes up, uh, other kinds of zoning changes that would promote uh, more development in town. So in the hope that uh, having more housing would help to drive the price of housing down with respect to either rent or home ownership. Uh, those are big issues. <laughs> and I'm not saying that town council or anybody else should not tackle them. I absolutely believe they are important. On the other hand, I think to bury the affordable housing policy in those larger issues is not the right thing to do. I think you've got an affordable housing policy before you that that's what town council should act upon, and then it should take the next step for a larger policy that would address the broader issues that I know you all as are concerned about, as am I. So that's, that's my view, Pat. Thank you for asking. Thank you, John. Do you have any other discussion, Pat? Okay, uh, not right now. I guess I just want to amplify what John said, that it, these are separate, that we need to work on the affordable housing policy, and we need to create a larger, separate um, town council-generated policy on housing. I, I do have one question. I'm channeling Jim Oldham a little bit, who um, I'm curious about um, the impact of if 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 housing is built um, and subsidies given to a family so they can purchase it, there doesn't seem to be any drawback of that amount when the house gets sold. And part of me understands that because it doesn't belong to it, it's my house now, and I should be able to reap the profit of it. But I'm. I, thinking about Jim always talking about that $50,000 or whatever was generated for the first to come back into a town fund that could then be reused by other people. And, and I guess I, I'm being not very articulate and I apologize, but I'd like your uh, response or thoughts about that. Yes, John. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, uh, the Community Preservation Act Committee, of which Jim recently left, had made that concern clear to Valley Community Development, who applied for a homeownership subsidy program a year ago. They have now submitted a new proposal, and in order to be responsive to that complaint, uh, their new proposal is structured so that the $50,000 that each family would receive would, I believe, and I may not get this exactly right, but my understanding is it would be an interest-free loan for the period 
in which the family owned the home, and then when they sold it, the $50,000 would have to be paid back to the town. And a couple people I talked to suggested there was some ambiguity about whether it just goes into the general town revenue pool or it returns to CPA. I would hope the latter, but I really can't speak to that. So I'm going to take an opportunity to talk about my thoughts on what to do and recommend on housing policy. Um, you know, the council under the charter is the chief policymaker in the town. So from that point of view, I think any policy, whether it be affordable housing or housing in general or some transportation policy or some other thing we might come up with at some point um, should be adopted by the council, number one, um, and maybe should be generated by the council. Um, certainly when there are town committees that specialize in those areas, using their expertise to help generate it makes a lot of sense to me um, because we as counselors in some sense are more generalists than specialists. Um, and so from that point of view, I really thank the Housing Trust for starting that process because you guys are more expert on affordable housing than I probably will ever be. Um, but it, the question in my mind is at what point does it then, does the council sort of take control of that policy and start modifying it to what the council believes the town needs to create under its authority as chief policymaker, the policy. Um, and that timing for me is probably somewhere about now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if we were to expand the referral that we had from the council to expand on recommendations, I think my recommendation would, my thoughts would agree generally with what finance came up with, which is that there should be a recommendation to sort of send this off to a committee for revision for potential recommendation back to the council for adoption. Um, you know, I hear what John says and I hear what you say, Pat, about affordable housing might need its separate policy. And so I struggle with doing that before a full housing policy. To me, I, I think of housing most of, what I've heard is not just that we lack affordable housing, but we lack lower A, as people like to say, affordable housing, the, the what I've termed workforce housing, those at 100% AMI and slightly higher, and those between 80 and 100% AMI. And a, to me, the policy can't be separate from the big A affordable policy. I think they're interrelated. And as you said, there's a lot of big, big issues to deal with that workforce housing, but that also relates to the AM, AD, AMI, and lower housing too. And so I think in my mind, I'd prefer a comprehensive policy that maybe sets forth specifically in it affordable, big A affordable housing policies along with others so that it's one policy, not two or three. Um, that's sort of where I'm thinking now. I'm not set on that because I, you know, I, I'm still figuring things out. But that's that's where my thinking is now. Um, you know, I don't know where other people's total thinking is. We've heard a little bit, Dorothy. Oh, I agree with you, and I think that we're at a very important time um, in which many people are thinking about housing, and many people are speaking to me and or trying to get together to talk about how does, how does the town work? How do we come up with a complete picture? And so I would be very happy for CRC to um, work on, um, and to work with the town staff, to work on generating such a policy to bring forward to the town council. Um, and I think that the report that, um, that John Hornick has brought to us is a very important part of understanding the picture. 
I also do agree that it's a very big picture which has to include UMass. It has to include the whole system. We're very interrelated. Andy and then Pat. Uh, now turning to this committee and speaking as a member of this committee and thinking of it in a broader, speaking in a broader sense than um, just the finance issues. Uh, housing is, uh, I think, as we experienced from our own lives and from our campaign and what we observed and heard as we talked to citizens during the campaign when we um, were running for council, um, and it needs to be addressed in a comprehensive manner. I think that there's another point that we were sort of circling around a little bit in the finance committee discussion, but in, in this committee's discussion, that needs to be considered, and that is the degree to which we need to really look at housing opportunities broadly because um, we don't want to isolate communities. We want to have um, people who are of um, varied incomes and backgrounds living together in, a, in single communities. Um, and that, um, that speaks for a larger policy. I think that the biggest concern then would be if it takes longer to develop a policy uh, that's a comprehensive policy, does that in effect uh, delay making progress towards achieving some of the affordable housing um, initiatives that might otherwise be undertaken? And I guess I don't think so, because we have a pretty strong commitment in this community and we want to formalize it with a better policy, but we're making a lot of progress right now. There's a lot of um, new opportunities that have been opened up and developed and being pursued um, over the past couple of years. Nothing has slowed us down, and uh, I think it's a point that has been made by several different people in this conversation. Uh, so I think we can, um, as a council, say that we encourage uh, the continuation of every possible effort to um, create affordable housing at the earliest opportunity as we develop a policy. I don't think it has to be mutually exclusive. Pat? I think we should move forward with the housing trust affordable housing policy and that it can be integrated into the larger document that the town council creates. I am concerned that not um, moving forward with it will affect uh, what happens with affordable housing uh, as defined right now by the trust. Um, so I think it's very easy. Um, to lose sight of what we have control over and what we don't have control over. We don't have control over the market forces in town in terms of properties. Um, we do have control over zoning and can create some new zoning laws that allow for uh, denser development, tiny house development, accessory dwelling that could affect um, town-wide housing options for people who are above the 80% limit. But I think that we should move forward with the housing trust policy now. So can I ask for a clarification? When, <laughs> when, when you say move forward, one of the things we were discussing was where does the final modification of, if we stick with an affordable housing policy only, where does that final modification happen? When you say move forward, do you foresee that happening in the trust or with a council committee? I see it happening in the trust. Okay. Uh, can, I actually actually want to ask John and Dave a question about housing policy development. I don't think we've ever asked you, did you, the trust receive any staff help in developing the policy that was presented to us? 
Um, and you know, if so, what was it? If not, how did you guys go about developing that? And then to Dave, a similar question, in developing policies in the past, obviously we've never had a council before, so it's sat in town committees. What kind of staff help has been used for the development of you know, similar policies? So we'll start with John. Um, I would say that we did have some staff help, but not a huge amount of staff help. Um, uh, Nate Malloy is staff to the Housing Trust, and Nate certainly participated in most of the meetings where this was discussed. Uh, he may have provided some information to us, but he wasn't a framer of the policy um, or a drafter of the policy. Uh, the second person is Rita Farrell, who is our consultant. Again, this isn't a main part of what we rely upon Rita for, but she's typically at our meetings, and she would also, being present, have contributed to it. The main drafting of the policy was done by me. Um, we also formed committees that met and disbanded and others that met again that were all formed of people who are members of the Housing Trust. So really, by and large, this is a policy of the Housing Trust. It was not something that was framed and developed by town staff. Um, the other thing I'll say, in just in, I, I, in generally I like this report, um, but one thing honestly that I found a little funny is that a number of the recommendations, particularly beginning with the very first one, uh, were the opposite of the, what I was getting from members of the trust. Every time I would present a new draft, people would have criticism of the content but also they would say, John, it's too long, you have to cut it down. And that was something that we heard from Alyssa Brewer when the policy was presented in the first discussion of town council. So I, again, I don't know what the conclusion is, but I do think that it's something to keep in mind when there's all these things that we think should be in it. Uh, you just can't have them all in it because then people don't read it or pay attention and so I was constantly getting the feedback from the trust, this has to be streamlined. Okay, thank you. Dave? So I would just echo, you know, obviously on this policy, John is, is spot on. Um, I guess historically, I think it's fairly simple that staff normally in my time with the town would not get involved in creating policy. The select board had some policies um, I think it's a little bit surprising if you do your research, and Andy certainly uh, uh, might be more knowledgeable than I am uh, uh, as a former select board member, but um, how few policies we actually have. We have lots of plans in Amherst, um, but not a tremendous number of policies. Um, so staff would perhaps support the select board or the town manager in working with the select board formally, but we would not be in the, in the driver's seat on developing policy. Um, I did just wanna just make a quick comment, a couple of quick comments. One is that <clears throat> from a staff standpoint, from my staff standpoint, um, we fully recognize that affordable housing is a very critical priority for the town. So whether there is a policy or whether there isn't, we are, moving forward at the same pace, I think that we would, it, whether this is adopted or tomorrow or, or not. So we, we recognize the importance of affordable housing. We're working through CPA, East, East Street School uh, proposal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I did just want to acknowledge, you know, all the discussion that I've listened to over the past couple of months on this policy, I think has been um, really important and has uh, raised awareness about this issue uh, even higher than it was before all these discussions. So on one hand, I, I really um, want to kind of acknowledge John, the trust in, in helping to raise the bar through these discussions, but also um, that I, I, I feel that we don't want to lose that momentum, if you will. So if the, the council 
decided that they wanted to create a larger policy. I wonder if there's some way to acknowledge in time to say, you know, the policy as of, you know, January 2020 that has been developed is by and large, uh, the council is supportive of it. If you decide to go to a larger uh, policy, that this can be incorporated in. I, I don't want to put words in John's mouth. We've never talked about this, but if I were in the trust position, I would just want to make sure that if there is a lar if the de decision is to make a larger policy, that we wouldn't need to go back to square one on this mm -hmm. a month from now or three months from now or, or whenever that policy gets developed. So that there could be some acknowledgement that this is really good work. It's, it's very close to where the council wants it to be, but they want to plug it into a larger policy that may take a little time. So it acknowledges all the work. It acknowledges where uh, the council uh, might be on affordable housing. So I'm not advocating for the larger policy. I'm just saying it, I think it would be a shame to go back, you know, a couple of months from now. The other thing is I think we need to look and say, okay, what other communities have a comprehensive housing policy and how quickly could, you know, staff work with you all and the, the larger council to develop that? Thank you. Um, Pat. Yeah, I'm not opposed to a comprehensive policy, but I do feel that we, I would like to work on accepting the uh, housing trust policy on affordable housing um, because we need to stand forward and show that Amherst is really committed and we have a tendency to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, and I think we are doing fairly well in terms of addressing affordable housing. But I would hate to see uh, you know, any uh, fallback because we didn't um, vote for this now in favor of the acceptance of the policy. Dorothy. And then well, I am very aware of the many long discussions we had in the Finance Committee as to why accepting the policy as it is now might not be a good idea. But I do agree with um, Mr. Zomik that it obviously would be part of the, the considerations of a comprehensive policy. Uh, in terms of keeping up momentum, uh, perhaps we could try to do a zoning change slash clarification to make sure that inclusionary zoning, which has not been triggered uh, as often as it should be, um, be clarified so that new construction include, uh, I believe it's 12% inclusionary zoning. That would keep some momentum going and uh, in the direction that we need to go. I also agree that we should consult with other communities and look at their policies and see if there's something that seems to work for us. Uh, one other item that I mentioned last uh, was yesterday afternoon in the Finance Committee was that when we look at the chart that I've been given many times of, of what the town has done, and it's pretty, it's quite impressive, over time uh, to aid affordable housing, I can't tell from it which is, I can't tell the cost effectiveness because they're, the, the figures are all in different formats. They, somehow we need to have a sense that, of what kinds of, of things we have done uh, and what they have cost and to make some idea of how many of them are the are ways that we think we should be going forward and emphasizing more. But I, I think we need, we need a comprehensive policy. I do believe in uh, what I call integrated housing where pe people of different incomes live closer together uh, and because um, I think that's how our town functions best. Yeah, I think that there is a way to pull all of this together. I think it's important to note that in the Finance Committee discussion and in the discussions in this committee, I don't think that there was disagreement with the idea that we need, that goals are helpful and important. There was a point that was made by the um, trust when it created um, the proposal for consideration by committees um, and uh, a goal keeps one focused on moving in a direction. I think that the two points that were being added really by the Finance Committee to the goal question was 
in the end, uh, one of us, that in the end, you look at each particular proposal as to whether it is a cost-effective means of moving towards achieving the goal. Um, and uh, so you have to do a case-by-case -case assessment always of each proposal coming forward as to whether it is the right um, step to take. And uh, the other is the question of flexibility um, to recognize that uh, as we did with the uh, percent for art, that uh, council uh, would have the ability to come back if need be and look at the percent for art number and that the same flexibility should be built into any goal with this policy so that goals don't end up driving us to do things that are economically um, or just policy-wise um, an unattractive um, option for the community to take. Uh, Another thing that was recognized, um, I think, in both committees is the importance of um, not losing sight of moving forward with other initiatives, uh, including the various zoning proposals that have been referred to several t times during this discussion. Um, so I think that we're not that far away if we keep it um, in, in its first step focused on affordable housing and then um, say if, if we decide we want to recommend looking at a broader policy, um, consider that as a second step. So that's one thing we could uh, suggest from this committee. In the end, um, I do uh, believe that if we look at our form of government as to, determined by the charter, that a council passed policy is town policy and that an affordable housing trust policy is a suggestion of the affordable housing trust but it is not town policy. There is a big difference and if we can take the work that was begun with the affordable housing trust make the modifications that have become um, evident in the discussions of both committees and move it forward and develop a concrete town policy and have it adopted by the council, that uh, it is a stronger policy because we've taken that step. Okay, thank you. I wanna acknowledge it's been a couple minutes since our fifth member arrived, but Steve did arrive. Um, so he's here and listening now. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you're on video or not. You might be out of the video range, out of the camera range. <laughs> but I, I thought I'd acknowledge that you're here. Um, obviously, you've heard a little bit. Do you have anything not at this point? Okay. Um, we've been discussing this for about 40 minutes, and I'm wondering if we have, if we're ready for any motions. I don't know if we'll have consensus on any motions given the discussion I've heard, but it might be good to have something in a vote to send back to the council. I don't know what that might look like at this time, um, but I thought I'd put out there whether anyone has a motion or some sort of item they'd like to ask us to vote on. I can try. I'm not the best motion framer. Um, I move that we, uh, CRC, um, set forth to work on a comprehensive housing policy for the town of Amherst, taking into consideration as one of the important aspects the housing trust um, policy or suggestion on affordable housing, and that we consult with other towns and with the town staff and work up a policy to present to the town council for discussion and hopeful acceptance. That's long. Um, <laughs> what if, if, why don't you rephrase it? That would be the way. <laughs> Do you want me to rephrase that? So, so, so what I, I heard um, was that you want 
you moved that CRC begin working on a comprehensive housing policy, um, taking into consideration the draft policy um, in order to propose a, in order to make recommendations to the full council. That's correct. Is that okay? So before I ask for a second, I want to clarify something in that motion. Um, is your motion to recommend that the council task us with taking a look at a comprehensive housing policy or that we just do it on our own? Well, I thought in your previous remarks, you felt that we had that already and did not need to be asked, but um, I am yield to your judgment. I'm just asking which one your your intent was. Well, we haven't done the reorganization yet, so that's that's part of the problem, right? The the new committee has not yet been officially created. Um, I guess if we'll stick with past practice, I am asking that the town council task us with creating this policy. Based on what Dorothy just said, I've got a brief revision of what that motion might read. So I'll read that and see if that's okay with you. Um, move that the CRC recommend that the council refer to CRC the development of a comprehensive housing policy for the town of Amherst, taking into consideration the trust's draft policy in order to make recommendations to the full council. Is that? Is that in line with yes. your thinking? Okay, do I hear a second to that motion? A second. Andy will second it. Do we have discussion on that motion? Yes, Pat. Um, I would like to see us um, a friendly amendment where the Housing Trust and CRC work together to develop housing policy. So my inclination is to have that as a vote. Um, I, I'm not hearing immediate friendliness that it would be friendly from Dorothy. Um, so let's have some discussion on that before we vote on whether to add that it would be an adding in some clause that says working with the housing trust would be added into that motion. Um, refer to CRC to work with the housing trust. Yeah, um, John. Um, when we're talking about a comprehensive policy, the devil is in the details. And a not important element, but a, port, a large part of a town comprehensive policy is going to be uh, necessarily uh, include areas that are the province of the planning board. When we talk about zoning, particularly, but lots of other things, encouraging accessory dwelling units, uh, various kinds of zoning, uh, just, I mean, and, and it is also an area which the Housing Trust did not develop as part of its report. So, I'm not sure that it makes sense for this committee to say it would work with the Housing Trust. Rather, I think it should seek input from the Housing Trust, seek input from the Planning Board, um, rather than trying to create uh, one larger body um, with all that representation. Um, the other thing is, a few people said, well, 
you might view the first task as uh, completing the review of the affordable housing trust policy and sending that back to town council before biting off the much larger piece of the apple that involves a comprehensive policy. And I'll be saying, I would welcome a comprehensive policy. Anything that you can do to increase production and drive down costs in the town will benefit affordable housing. At the same time, it benefits other people who aren't included in that definition. Any other thoughts on Pat's motion to essentially add working with the trust to the? I, I see there would be oppo opposition from the town council of singling out one body. I think John's comments were very on target. Uh, obviously, we would work with those who have in the past dealt with housing, uh, whether it be the housing trust, the planning board, um, and town staff. So I, th I think that your suggestion is that we do not accept the friendly amendment. Yep. So as I said, we were going to have a vote on it. I realized we might not have formally received a second, so I will be that second for the purposes of the minutes um, because we've already started discussion, um, and, and I said we would vote on it. Um, so we need a second for it. Is there further discussion on this amendment? So then I'll ask for a vote on the amendment to add the phrase working with the AMT into the um, motion. All those in favor of it, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. We've got a zero five, so that motion fails unanimously. <laughs> well, you can you can move and then not support it. <laughs> it's totally possible to do that. <laughs> um, so, um, thank you for your comments, John, on that. Um, that does give, uh, what I want to say is before we, as we move into discussion on the main motion, um, is that his seek input, while I personally don't believe that wording needs to be in a motion, um, as chair of CRC, I think it's our duty to go to the experts as we're doing this, and those experts, as I said earlier, you know, and so a development of a policy from, from chairing CRC's point of view, as we've done with the master plan process, have gone to the planning board and all of that, I foresee would be sent off, similar to what the trust did when they developed a draft policy that we're discussing now, sent off to multiple committees for comment. And so I would see something like that happening in this instance too, but I'm not sure it needs to be in the motion itself personally. Um, any further discussion on the motion that is for CRC to recommend that the council refer to CRC the development of a comprehensive housing policy for the town of Amherst taking into consideration the trust's draft policy in order to make recommendations to the full council? Andy. The only thing that we could consider adding, but I don't know that it's necessary, I'll just point it out, is that a key sentence in the Finance Committee report is that the final development and approval of a housing policy should be a council responsibility and priority. Um, and the words and priority was included purposefully in the Finance Committee discussion because we didn't want delay um, unnecessarily um, in suggesting this. So, uh, whether we wanted to put something from this committee to create a similar thought. Thoughts? Here, here. Pat, Pat, not Pat, Dorothy. <laughs> Sorry, Dorothy says, implies she supports that. Um, would that, you know, we've got a motion. I'm not sure, would, how did you word it in the, in the finance committee? 
Um, Sorry, is this committee uh, is the, the development and approval of a policy oh, should be a council responsibility, responsibility and, priority, and, and priority. So I'm just looking at our motion here and how would we add that in in order to make recommendations. I think it would be as part of we could add within a certain amount of time a quick date turnaround. Mm. Or we can argue over date. Yeah. I, I like and a priority. As a, so we could potentially add the, the, the development of a comprehensive housing prior, housing policy as a priority for the town or for the town council as a priority or or, or something, something like that priority. would that okay I so the I like the word responsibility and it is priority it just helps me well council responsibility by referring the development I think that implies the responsibility it's okay. it's the prioritization of it or refer to CRC to prioritize the development of a comprehensive housing policy. I'm trying to figure out how that would go in. So there's uh, move the CRC recommend the council refer to CRC to develop to prioritize the development of a comprehensive policy, or refer to CRC the development of a compre housing, comprehensive housing policy for the town of Amherst as a priority taking into consideration. Those are the two options I've come up with. I don't like making it a verb. I think the first, as, as a noun, it's better. So the noun was the second one, I think. The noun was a priority. <laughs> yeah. okay, okay, as a priority. Yeah, to prioritize has okay. slightly yep. different senses. Yep, okay. Um, Dorothy was the one that made that, the original motion. Um, it was seconded by Andy. Um, I'm not hearing a lot of disagreement about it, so I will ask Dorothy and Andy if adding that language in is okay yes. without a vote. Yes, okay. it is. Correct. So that's what we will do on that one. Um, any further discussion on Dorothy's motion? Seeing none, I will take a vote. The motion as it stands reads, Move that the CRC recommend that the council refer to CRC the development of a comprehensive housing policy for the town of Amherst as a priority, taking into consideration the trust's draft policy in order to make recommendations to the full council. Um, all those in favor of that motion, please raise your hands and say aye. Aye. I've got, there are four there. All those against, please raise your hand and say nay. We've got one. Um, that is five, so there's no abstains there. So that motion passes. Um, in order for report writing, I think I've gotten most of what you've said, Pat, but, but I, is there anything you'd like to ensure that I include when writing this? I'm just concerned that the housing trust policy be the policy that we follow until CRC can draft something else. I feel like there's a, while there is an overall need for housing in Amherst, the critical element here for me is that it's for people 80% of area median income and less. And, and that in truth, we have done very little for the uh, people who are at 15% or below housing. So I just don't want to, for even for a moment, step away from the goals of the Housing Trust. Okay, I will make sure to include that in. Any further discussion on this item at all before we move on? Seeing none, we are going to move on to item 3B on our agenda, and that is the percent for art bylaw proposal and discussion of report from the ad hoc committee. So last, oh yes, thank, thank you Dorothy. Thank you John for coming. Um, I appreciate you taking your time to answer our questions and give us your opinions. Thank you. um, well. And we'll be in touch especially as if it's referred back to us as it gets developed. Um, last meeting, the CRC voted to um, let me find the, the motion. 
we voted to recommend that the council refer the bylaw back to the ad hoc committee for to address concerns regarding the membership of the qualified arts jury and its role in the process. That was a four to one vote um, with Steve in the negative and the rest of the committee in the, po in the support of that motion. In the meantime, since the meeting, they took that and didn't bother to wait for that to show up to the council, which is actually fantastic, I think, um, and just had another meeting and dealt with what our recommendations and our concerns were and have already brought back for consideration a revised bylaw. Um, I received that from the chair of the committee and we have the chair of the Public Arts Commission here. Um, so I'm gonna let him discuss the changes in the discussion that you had in that ad hoc committee that brought us the revised version for our discussion today and you know, in dealing with what our concerns were. So thank you, Bill Kazin, William Kazin, for being here to talk about that today. Thank you for having me back. Um, there were two issues that came up last time, two substantive issues. Mandy pointed out that while we had a qualified arts jury um, in the draft of the bylaw, the jury uh, wasn't the final decider. It was the Public Art Commission, and I think that was an excellent point to have raised and something that didn't come up in our conversations, and it really led to uh, some deeper thought about the issue. And we um, realized that there were to, that the implication of having a jury is that a jury decides. This is certainly true in the art world. When you convene a jury, the jury becomes the final arbiter. Um, but as the bylaw was worded, while we had a jury, the Public Art Commission could overrule that jury. So there were two models on the table, really, as far as we were concerned. Have a jury and allow that jury to make the final decision, or continue to allow the Public Art Commission to make the final decision and change the name of the jury to the, an advisory board. And so after a lot of conversation, um, we decided for a variety of reasons that it was better to keep the Public Art Commission as the final deciding body and to not uh, stick with the misnomer jury, uh, which doesn't mean that the advisory board can't vote or, you know, in my mind that we, they would still actually vote for their choices. We'd use ranked choice voting to give us um, their preferred choice and then we would strongly um, follow their recommendation, but it, it allows the Public Art Commission, which is a town appointed body of town residents, to make that final decision and we are the people ostensibly who know best uh, about the town in general, about the desires of the town, how the council works, what the staff input has been. And so if there's any situation, financial or otherwise, that might cause us to have reservations about that decision, it allows us then to overrule it. But I would expect that the precedent will be that the, that the advisory board will give us their final decision and that we will base our, our decision strongly on, on that. So that was one piece of um, the change that we made. So if you look under definitions now, instead of saying, and throughout the document, um, jury, we now refer to a percent for art advisory committee. The other point was one that had come up several times um, uh, Dorothy Pam had raised it and a number of other people just to ensure or try to be as clear as possible about stakeholders being involved in either the jury or the what is now we're calling an advisory committee. And so we tweaked the wording a little bit. We felt like that was already part of the vision for this and part of the wording, but we, 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 we um, adjusted the wording a little bit to make that even, even stronger under the um, section of definitions just to make it clear. So those were the, the two changes we felt like your input was, um, was very helpful and uh, we feel like the bylaw is stronger for it. Thank you. Thank you, and I wanna acknowledge, so the chair, Bill, has sat on that committee and I believe two of our CRC members are on that committee. Andy is on the ad hoc committee and I think Steve is on that ad hoc committee, right? So, um, and, and what was the, can you remind me what the vote on the committee was for this Revi revision, was it a unanimous yeah. vote? Okay. Um, so is there any discussion on the new, it was, ref this, this whole bylaw has been referred to us and along with finance um, to make a recommendation to the council. So um, is there any further discussion on, we had a very comprehensive discussion last meeting about the bylaw in general and those were the concerns. Given the revision, do we have further discussion on a potential recommendation to the council on this bylaw? 
Pat. Um, I want to thank the committee for the revisions. I think they're good. Um, I'm having much more trouble supporting this than I had before. Um, and since CRC is um, looks at impact, I've been really talking to a wide range of people around town, around taxes, and um, I feel like I can't now support something that could add quite a bit of money to the town building projects. So I just want to be straightforward about that. Uh, Andy. Yeah, I need to quickly pull up the Finance Committee report, which was adopted yesterday in support of this. Um, the reality is, is that it actually does not have a substantial impact on the um, cost, and the, we need to emphasize that as we go forward if, uh, in, in our discussion. The um, amounts, um, you, might, you might have it right at your hand, because I would have to go look as I'm speaking, and that's hard to do. But uh, the, the, the amounts were not of such significant um, significance that the Finance Committee was uh, hesitant on it. Uh, thank you, Dorothy. Um, except the Except the, except the table is incomplete because it has X's <laughs> into the boxes as opposed the to the numbers. Well, it's $5,000 anyway. It's $175,000 and 35000 so. Yeah, and that, That's the total. I, I think what Andy was going with per person, per resident on the resident tax basis is smaller versus the number you quoted, which is 175000 on a $35 million project would be the total amount. Yeah, because you have to remember So we'll do Andy and then Pat and then Dorothy Keith. Yeah, you just have to remember that um, it isn't the total amount, it's the amount. It, it, you need to look at it in two different ways. One is that if you bond out a project and it is being paid for from the general fund, it is not the total amount that you're adding to the bond, but the amount you're paying back per year and the um, effect that that has on the other capital needs. And if you're looking, if it becomes a debt exclusion override, how much is the debt exclusion override adding to the taxation of an average property? So those are the key numbers to look at. Yeah, and if you look at the numbers that finance came back with on it, the biggest number we're probably looking at right now is about $20 million. You're talking about uh, 5,000 a year or so if it's coming from the general fund, 2,000, this is at, at a 20 year bond. A 30 year bond would be about 2,500. And then if it's um, an override, it's about $2 to $2.50 a year per average taxpayer. So it, it, it is, um, there is money being asked for for this, absolutely it's not a huge amount of money. So it, I think it's up to the council to decide and the town to decide whether that amount of money is appropriate to have art projects integrated into these construction projects. Okay, so I think my order was Pat, then Dorothy, then Steve. So yes. oh. Pat's gonna okay. pass now, so Dorothy and then Steve. My, mine is very brief. I think that we need to have uh, this put into language that not only can I understand, but that I can actually explain to other people. And we're not there yet. Um, I'm taking it on faith that it's not gonna cost that much, but I would really need to know some, what Andy was saying, how much it would add on to your tax bill per year. Because it, it can look pretty frightening. And I think in, unless we can really understand it and explain it, to other people will have a problem, but I am totally in support of Percent for Art. Steve. Yeah, so I have a different viewpoint on this, that my viewpoint is that it might not add, it, add anything. So half a percent is very absorbable into the cost of a building project. So Amherst doesn't have recent experience with vertical construction. The police station was the last ground up building that we built. But when we do build buildings, we tend to build really good buildings. And within really good buildings, there are a lot of variables from furnishing to finishes to on and on and on. So the way that I see this is simply directing the building team 
to be redirecting some of those funds, say from, I don't know, finishes to art. So I, I, I actually don't think that it should even be presented as something that's adding to the taxes, but that's something that's simply um, reallocating the priorities of how the building is built to ensure that art is part of it. And so the, the price to pay for that is completely absorbable from, in my humble opinion, from the other components of the building project. Any further comment from committee members? Um, what I'm gonna add to it very briefly with a, I share Pat's concern, um, despite some of the numbers we hear from the, the ad hoc committee and the finance committee who worked hard on figuring out what those numbers would be. What allows me to support this bylaw is the fact that there is, in the middle of the bylaw, the ability to have the council um, vote to exclude, you know, um, the council may by majority vote lower or eliminate the percentage for art on any qualifying construction project. So that really does allow us to say it's really important, but it's hard to guess those numbers and figure out how they might affect the taxpayers or the um, funding you know, and, and annual budget. And so we can look at each project individually and say, this one doesn't have a large effect or any effect on the taxpayers, depending on what the budget is, and therefore it should go forward, or this one does. And so that's one of the key parts of this bylaw that allows me to support re recommending it. Um, any further discussion? Oh, one comment. Dorothy. It's, it's one thing that's kind of confusing is we've seen uh, in lo neighboring towns projects go down when they're told this particular project on an, on an override is going to cost you this much. Even though it was made common sense to have the thing, people are getting very annoyed about taxes and tax increases. So I really liked what Steve said about uh, don't think of art as something that we stick on extra that costs separate, um, that it can be integrated into the building. But on the other hand, this is, we're talking public art. We're talking about art that expresses the town, the town's feelings, its history, its culture, and that, that we, the public, are part of it, that we are helping to uh, choose, create, and, and pay for it as we pay for the building. So um, I'm not quite sure how we present it, but I think we need to have some, we need to spend some time thinking about how we talk about financial implications of this when we talk to people, because people are gonna ask questions. But on the other hand, if we ever get through with some of this, people are gonna be very proud and happy, and they're gonna feel that, that this is something that we in the town of Amherst have, have done. Any further discussion? I just wanna yeah. say that uh, we're also gonna have to figure in uh, maintenance of the works of art, um, maintenance of this area around it, impact on design. Um, I, as a former artist, Dorothy, you know that I love the art world. I've talked a little bit about my reaction to seeing my first live Van Gogh um, at the Guggenheim. Um, but this feels to me, maybe it's my working class roots, even though I've made it into the middle class, I feel strongly that I don't want to add another dollar right now when I hear people across economic a range of economic levels here in town saying that within the next five years they may have to leave because of increases in taxes. Um, and this just is one more penny. Um, I, I, I just can't do it. And it's hard because I voted for it in town meeting. I can't do it this time. Any further discussion? So based on the discussion, I'm gonna recommend that the motion that we make be to recommend the council adopt the percent for art bylaw as presented. Um, does someone want to either make that motion or make a different motion? I'll make that motion. Okay, so Steve is making that motion. Is there a second to that motion? I will second it. 
Is there further discussion? All those seeing no further discussion, um, we will be voting on the motion to recommend the council adopt the percent for art bylaw as presented. All those in favor of that motion, raise your hand and say aye. 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 I see four in favor. All those against, raise your hand and say nay. nay. I see nay. one against, or no. <laughs> pick, pick your negative word. <laughs> pick the no word. <laughs> um, what the process will be from this point, um, once our committee and finance committee receives, has made their recommendations and has finished working with this, the original referral on this was that it would go automatically after this to the GOL committee for its final bylaw review as required by our rules um, and their charge. So I will make sure I send our notice to the GOL chair that CRC has made its final recommendation and is, from its point of view, has completed its own review um, so that CRC can take it up for its final review. Um, I assume the chair of finance will do the same if they have finished their review. We have finished our review and uh, report, so I will send a note to the GOL also. Excellent. Um, Dorothy. Yeah. Uh, just a, a quick comment. I, I totally do understand where Pat is coming from, and I, I have similar feelings at various times. But I was just thinking to myself, if we don't do this at this moment of capital projects, the boat will have sailed. And then I remembered one of my little hobbies is to go to WPA projects, uh, the national parks, the buildings. And I go to them because they're beautiful. And they were built in a time of great economic difficulty and they also provided work for people. This is partly an economic development, I think, proposal to help employ artists. So it's hard because I, I really do feel this, the, the, it's, it's all around us, the worry about taxes. But I think that we can create some things, we can make the things that we need for town, we can make them buildings with beauty, if not, and perhaps even beautiful buildings. But if we don't do it now, it'll be too late. Um, Pat, I just want to say, when I write the memo, I think I've gotten all of what you said. So, so if I'll, I'll try to forward it to you for review. But, but I've I've got your comments down. So I just want to make sure, since it's going to be included in the memo, that I acknowledge that. Um, that takes us to agenda item three C at this point. Um, thank you, Bill, for appearing at at the meeting and talking about the committee's work. I appreciate it. Um, and so 3C is master plan, um, review and respond to the planning board recommendations and feedback on the process that we proposed to the town council on December 18th for updating and adopting the master plan in accordance with charter section 9.8. We had initially reported back to the council on December 18. Uh, the planning board took up the final memo I had presented to the and sat in front of the planning board to answer some questions on December 18th. And then on January 8th, I believe, they also had a discussion. And that discussion resulted in uh, myself as chair being forwarded a number of feedback matters. And so um, I felt we needed to discuss that before it gets back to the council as a whole based on the vote that we had on December 18th. So I have brought it back onto this agenda um, the packet itself has the feedback that we received we received feedback from the chair of the planning board and uh, one of the members michael burt whistle um, from the planning board we received comments from both of them and so i would like to open up a discussion on our process as put in the december 18th memo based on that feedback and whether we would like to modify our process and recommendation to the town council based on that feedback. I, maybe I should summarize what that feedback was <laughs> for the people that don't have the documents in front of them um, and the audience. So I will, I will do that as I pull these up. Um, so the planning board chair 
if I can get these up, um, indicated that the planning board were unable to, members were unable to agree um, on how to respond to the CRC memo. So she herself wrote, the chair wrote, um, that um, she strongly agrees with the necessary and obvious restriction um, and supports the thoughts of keeping the updates to items that are justifiable, relying on plans, policies, and goals. Um, specific comments, though, that she had was that the six-month timeline that we suggested was quite ambitious. Um, she interpreted that timeline as suggesting that it be a high priority for the planning board and the staff to update the master plan and expedite the effort, but she, rec she recommended that a nine-month deadline may be more realistic. Um, a second comment was the phrase on the last paragraph of page two of our memo. Um, the phrase town priorities is somewhat subjective, um, and so maybe if we could clarify what we're referring to in that one or remove that sentence completely, it would help um, lessen the subjectivity of potentially that sentence. Um, step four of the memo, she said she appreciates how vague that is um, on how we would be involved and informed through the planning board process and that it allows the planning board the freedom to develop its own process and plan. Um, and so that, that was feedback, but there was no suggested change to potentially anything in the memo regarding that one. Um, and then she suggested that a flowchart be created the next time we bring this up at a council meeting or to forward to the planning board so that people can, with a visual aid, really see the process that this updating process would go through with a nice visual aid. Um, the, so those were the recommendations and feedback we received from the planning board chair. Planning board member Michael Burtwistle um, talked mostly about the differences of approve and adopt. Um, and then, you know, and thought that that was relevant to our proposed plan. Um, and basically, you know, in the end, said that it seemed appropriate, um, given the new organization of town government and the age of the present master plan, that an updated version of the master plan should be developed for the council's adoption. Um, however, given the planning board has sole statutory authority for the creation and approval, the process proposed in CRC in its memo seems unnecessarily intrusive and overly complicated. So that was his main uh, feedback for the process. Um, did not really provide feedback as to how that might be modified, though. Um, both of these documents are in our packet. Um, he did indicate that on January 15th, the planning board will move ahead as a forced order and in a timely fashion with necessary and obvious incorporating other documents. Um, and postpone the equally necessary creation of a new master plan. Um, so that was the feedback from the other planning board member. Um, based on all of that, do we have discussion on our current memo and any changes that we might make to it in an updated way before sending it back to the council? Dorothy. Well, I was at that meeting and um, it was a very interesting meeting. The objections to the memo were several. Um, one was, it's too long, and in your meticulous listing of feedback going back and forth, um, it gets, they got confused as to when it stopped, and there was the feeling that it was just gonna go on forever, but I know that's not what it says. And uh, I just had wished that you could have been there because I think you could have explained things well. So I would suggest um, and, and, I, and I, your memo, the memo does say that the planning board has the chief responsibility for the master plan. That is said here. So perhaps, but that was an area of contention. There was a, a feeling, it was emotional, that um, their power and province was being um, intruded on. And, you know, so that was just kind of like a human reaction. So I think emphasizing where how where CRC sees itself in relationship to the planning board that the master plan is theirs but that we have been asked to do something which you you did say in here shortening and clarifying the memo 
And if there's any way to reduce some of those feedback loops, or maybe you could repeat them to us again, because that's that was where it, I think exasperation set in, the feeling of what? This is not ever gonna end. And then I think we should discuss, uh, uh, adopt and approve, because I think that was a very interesting discussion that, that Mr. Bert Whistle uh, put forward, but I think that we can, we can answer that. Other thoughts? Andy. Well, the changing from six months to nine months is relatively easy. I think that the harder one is the uh, next one where, because uh, it actually requires rewording and uh, it's going to be difficult to do that drafting as a committee right now on the whole. Um, I think we could um, request that the chair um, propose uh, language. Do we? Need, let me. I guess there's a question. Maybe I should ask it this way. Do we need to take final action today, or can we postpone it for two weeks and have um, work done on that one section that really needs some thought given, so that it's carefully and appropriately worded? Um, I don't think there's an absolute need to take final action today. That postponement would just postpone final action by the council and delay further the potential process. Um, I don't know whether maybe Dave can talk to this, um, whether our discussion of what that process in getting to adopting a master plan under the charter as required for the council to do so. Um, is if that delay is affecting when town staff and it sounds like the planning board has already agreed to start the process so if our delay in getting to a council vote on what the council process would look like is delaying that process from the town staff point of view so maybe dave can address that i don't think it's going to delay town staff work if the planning board has agreed to take this up at one of their upcoming meetings, I think that's great, and you know we're gonna we're gonna proceed, and there's plenty of work to do behind the scenes before we have further meetings. So, so with that statement, delaying our final revision to a, a plan probably does not affect moving forward on the actual adopt uh, modifications that the planning board may make. And so it's probably not necessary to adopt anything and vote on anything today. I, I think that they don't need our permission to be working on or looking at the, the revisions of the master plan, so we don't have to have the town council vote before it happens. And I do think that um, um, you, by yourself or you with somebody else, can um, work at the memo to make it something that's a little bit more presentable to the acceptable to the planning board members. Um, there, was, there was questions and comments. I think, I think the complexity was uh, an issue and I, I, I trust that you know how to simplify it. So let's start with the first one um, so that it sounds like we're not aiming for a vote today, we're aiming for a revision being presented next meeting, which means if I'm gonna be doing the revisions, I need some guidance. So um, the first, item of discussion from the chair of the planning board was the six to nine month change. Um, where do our committee members stand on that change? Andy. I'm fine with making that change. I hear a nodding from Dorothy. Other committee members? A nodding from Steve. Thoughts, Pat? Yeah, okay. Nope, that's that's fine. I have to find where that six month change is okay. in this document. Um, I, I wanna say that we will be working with the planning board and it's very important that our relationships be amicable. So yes. I have no problem in agreeing to the nine months. How 
come I cannot find where that, oh, there it is. Okay. So, so I will change the document to nine months. And do we want to add any qualifying statements about desiring it sooner if possible? Thoughts? No, I'm seeing no desire for that. So we will just change the number six to nine. And the next one on the chair's list was the town priorities one. That is one she, she had a recommendation to either reword or remove. Um, it sounds like there's a preference for rewording, not removing that clause. Um, changes in town priorities since the approval of the master plan is the clause. Um, is the preference for a rewording instead of a removal? I see no problem with removal. Other thoughts? Pat says she doesn't see a problem removing it. Steve's nodding his head that that would be okay. Andy? I personally don't have a problem. I just am trying to think of uh, my fellow counselors too. And uh, one, I think that there's a lot of support for uh, not losing anything that um, gets us moving forward with the ECAC recommendations and the policy we've developed. So I guess the question is whether there's a, that cross effect that we need to be aware of. So the clause after that says town adoption of plans, initiatives, and goals, and then lists climate action goals, flood mapping, a whole bunch of different things. We could actually pull, one option is to maybe pull climate out, the council climate action goals, which is the only thing in that list that's really from the council, and do instead of changes in town priorities um, to reflect you know, the change in the form of government, the council's adoption of climate action goals, and town adoptions of plans, initiatives, and goals, and or plans and initiatives, remove the goals from that one, and still keep the rest of the list the same. Because um, I think the town priorities, my memory of putting that in there was the one priority that sort of has really changed in the last decade has been the sustainability focus. Mm -hmm. So we could potentially reword it that way. That would make sense. Mandy, could I just add yes. one quick note there, just so so the, uh, the committee knows what staff has been thinking. Since last we met, there was also the announcement that we received um, through the MVP program, the funding for our climate action plan, which is really very exciting news. Um, I think the grant was $100,000 or so. And so that has a very tight timeline. In fact, we need to have that plan produced early in June of this year. So that's gonna, I think, fit very nicely with our master plan work, working with the planning board, because that is going to cover or uh, certainly be a document that can be referenced in um, the updates to the master plan. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're gonna get a real uh, boost, if you will, uh, with, a, with a wonderful consultant helping us to um, identify and articulate a number of climate action goals that really we identified in the 2010 master plan as not being there because a lot of people weren't thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna get a real boost there. So as we're working on the master plan, there'll be a parallel track for the climate action plan and it'll be really nice to have them that done say in the early June, mid June of this year. So right now I've modified that sentence, including revisions such as those to reflect the change in the form of government, the council's adoption of climate action goals, and town adoption of plans and initiatives, um, parentheses, including the transportation plan, updated flood mapping, et cetera, removing the climate action goals from that list. Um, so that is the redraft of that at this point. And the next planning board was appreciate step four is vague 
the wording allows the planning board the freedom to develop its own updating process plan and working with, they're currently working to define a specific process for themselves um, addressing the communication. So I don't see in her feedback any particular requested action on changing item number four in our proposed plan um, at this point. And then the flow chart, I can certainly work on one of those for next week um, to come up with a flow chart. And then the next memo is from Planning Board Member Bert Whistle. Um, and that one, oops, that's the wrong one. Um, I'm trying to find that one. I think I clicked it. Um, had talked about the difference between approve and adopt and then um, basically said that um, the plan, the full plan that we presented seemed unnecessarily intrusive and overly complicated. Dorothy had requested a discussion on the difference um, between approve and adopt as mentioned in the Burt Whistle memo. So any discussion on that at this time? Dorothy. Well, I, I have not been doing dictionary work, just mental thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I do kind of enjoy uh, looking at words. So I believe he's thinking, saying that adopt means we give you the plan, you follow it. But yet we have also many instances where the word adopt means vote for and then carry out. So I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say that the examples he gives are wrong, but that there are other examples of how the word adopt is used. Um, you are the uh, person who put the words in the charter I believe, so why don't you talk to us what you think adopt means? Um, so I'll speak on behalf of my membership on the Charter Commission at this point and what our discussion was and the purpose of the whole 9.8 section. Um, and I will also point out that the nine, section 9.8 actually says that the council shall adopt with or without revisions, the master plan. Um, so it specifically allows for the council to modify the master plan that is approved by the planning board. There was concern in the Charter Commission that if the council did not make a public statement in support of a master plan that the council and the planning board could end up working at odds, where the planning board has adopted a plan for the, t or has approved a master plan for the town that maybe the council doesn't like. Um, and then therefore, when the planning board suggests changes to zoning that are in accordance with that master plan, the council will not necessarily agree with them N not that they have to agree with them when they are in accordance with a master plan that the council adopts, but that, that if the council doesn't sort of buy into the master plan as approved by the planning board, then all of the work that is done by town staff and the planning board in response to the furtherance of that master plan that has been approved by the planning board under state law and becomes the master plan could be counteractive to what the council desires. And so there was a desire in the Charter Commission to sort of ensure that the town bodies, the planning board and then the town staff that have to react to that planning board approved master plan. And the council who is the policy setting body in town, chief policy makers in town, are at least sort of on the same page um, because they've adopted and agreed to a document and said, yes, this is the document that we as a council, as chief policy setters, are also in favor of moving forward with. Um, the with or without amendments was put in there for the recognition that, well, they might initially not agree. And so, mm -hmm. so at some point there might need to be a discussion between the planning board and their vision 
and their desire on their, what they came up with with the master plan and the council on their vision and what they ran on and what they were elected for by the town's residents mm -hmm. um, and their chief policy making ability to actually figure out a way to reconcile potential differences and that that's, that's the, the, as you said, the potential unending loop that we don't want to be unending. Um, but that's, that's the history around um, sort of why the Charter Commission felt it necessary to have the council formally adopt the master plan that under state law is not required to be acted on at all by the, by the council. Dorothy. So, so now you have confused me. I thought that the planning board had the last word. Now you're saying that the planning board can, after a process of back and forth, give us a document that they say, this is our final document, and that the council can say, well, I like most of it, but we want to change this one, and then the council votes to change one aspect, and, the, and that's it, which means that, in fact, the master plan is not the sole, that the, that the planning board is not the, the one that's total in control of it, that we can be, and that's what I think the problem is. Um, so uh, what is the history of this in terms of planning board and, and town government and uh, is this a change of power? That's what I guess I need to know. So you described the potential conflict that the Charter Commission did not resolve in yeah. its language, um, that in theory you could have a master plan approved by the planning board that the town um, planners and the town staff are by state law required to follow that is in conflict with a master plan adopted by the town council. So the whole point of the process we've been going through is to try to minimize as much as possible that from happening in order to create a dialogue between the two so that the document that is approved by the, by the planning board is the same document that is adopted by the council. So Steve had his hand up. Yeah, you, um, what am I gonna say? So there's a history, at least in New England, of separating out who does land use versus who does everything else. So for example, just south of us in Connecticut, municipalities have separately elected planning boards who are the keepers of, very clearly the keepers of the master plan and have autonomy to interpret those master plans. And then often the town meetings, select board, whatever the rest of the municipality is, has jurisdiction over everything else. But there's basically that separation of duties. So Massachusetts also gives great authority to its planning boards. It's in Mass General Law, Section 81D, which I'm reading right now. And actually, I don't find the word approve in there. So just to read <laughs> the very first paragraph of Section 81D, MGL, a planning board established in any city or town under 81A shall make a master plan of such city or town in or such parts or parts thereof of said board may deem advisable and from time to time may extend or perfect such a plan. So I guess that implies approval, but it doesn't actually use the word approval. So, but clearly the authority is given to the planning board and then that master plan then becomes, you know, first of all, any changes to land use have to refer to the master plan, but having a master plan on file also makes the town eligible for certain you know, for certain state aid. So it's very important to have that. So we do have this conflict. It's not totally unusual. Massachusetts it was approved by, you know, the attorneys reviewing this, but there are other communities that require this two-step process. So um, I, we seem to be debating the words approve versus adopt, but I don't even see the word approve in here. So maybe it's make versus adopt. So one of them makes it, the other one adopts it. I'm not sure what. The, the charter uses the word approved for, for the planning board. Can our charter trump state law? So the state law says make, okay, it can. On certain issues it can. So, but from, from the charter commissioner perspective, I think we used approve 
because um, that was the language probably that staff had generally used for what the planning board does when it votes on the master plan. So, but other thoughts on this issue that uh, planning board member Bert Whistle brought up and whether we are going to seek any changes or suggest any changes to our own master plan process in response to it. Andy. I, I don't think that we can effectively make a change. You know, we need to uh, recognize the, um, our charter, which has now been adopted by our voters, um, says what it says. And uh, the, uh, I mean, we do know that there's a history here that there were many members of town meeting who were uh, dissatisfied with the fact that they had no authority to adopt or comment upon um, the master plan, that it was totally something that belonged to the planning board under the former form of government. Uh, the Charter Commission uh, was responding to that, it did. Uh, it's not something that we need to discuss further because it's done. And uh, now we want to make sense of it. I think that the important thing that we want to do is make sure that we have a process that is appropriately respectful of the planning board and recognizes that the planning board is the body that develops and makes the recommendation and uh, that our goal is to have sufficient communication between the two bodies so that um, when it comes back for that last step to the uh, council that we have the least chance that there actually will be a rejection of a significant, anything significant in the master plan as it's presented and that um, that is what our proposed policy um, is intended to do uh, and uh, if we have a statement of that sort that gets developed and sent um, um, as a response, um, I think that's a, a strategic question that I'll leave to the chair. So um, it sounds like we are looking for a flowchart to be developed. We've modified the master, the proposed process that we will propose to the council. I don't hear any desire for any more modifications to that process than what we've discussed already. But I do hear a desire for a potential drafting of a response to the feedback we received specifically the feedback from planning board member Bert Whistle that addresses his concerns in his, his memo um, and the reasons why we're sticking with the proposal as, as indicated. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Well, I think you should include what the Andy's uh, historical comment that the um, town meeting as representative of the citizens of the town was um, unhappy with not having um, more, I guess, input, maybe that's the wrong word, on the master plan, and that is why the charter does leave the final word with the town council, but that the strong hope is that the process that you have outlined of going back and forth with revisions will result in no conflict at the end. So the question I have for the committee as we come up to our potential end time for needing to adjourn is, are we ready to vote on the updates to the master plan we talked about, the process that we talked about today, 
um, and leave a drafting of a memo. And is that memo a memo to the town council or a memo directly to the planning board from the CRC chair? And leave that up to the chair of CRC to get that feedback back to and that, that indication back to the planning board or do we need to bring that back? Do I need to bring that back to CRC at a later meeting? Can you um, send us the revision and ask us for comments? I, I think maybe it is important that we see the final copy because we're, we're talking about partly a question of fact and partly a, a, an issue of communication. So we wanna make sure that we're communicating very clearly. So I'm hearing that the vote will happen on the final proposed process to the council will happen at the next meeting, but also include some of the discussion and summary today in that. In that, I, I'm Dave over here is looking confused. <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking, I, w I wanted to make two co two comments. One is I, I I'm going to check on this, but I think a flow chart based on your memo may be in the works. Okay. So let me check on that. And then I just wanted to clarify what Dorothy's request was because was was it to have the chair create that memo and then revisit it for a vote at your next meeting? Because I don't think well, the committee could send comments back to you, right? I right. mean, that's really deliberating outside of a meeting. Do you follow me? Yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so we need I've, to just be I mean, careful. I've, I've been drafting the changes that we've discussed today into a new document. I've read them all to you. I can certainly just post that document as part of the packet for next meeting, and we can vote next meeting if that would be more comfortable for you to see those changes in writing. That's not a problem. We've already discussed that a delay of an extra meeting to the council is fine. Um, I guess the question is what what is my duty, what, what does the committee want me to do with regard to what we talked about in giving feedback back to the planning board or specifically responding to planning board member Bert Whistle's feedback to us? Um, what does the committee want that to look like? Is that something I bring to the committee next meeting or is that something I just draft and send off to the planning board chair for distribution to the planning board? I trust you to draft something and send it off. Others, Andy. I agree. I, I trust you, but I I just know that part of the reaction was the length of the memo. The length of the process itself. Yeah, yeah. The, it, well, it just I, it's it, I think the the longer it got, the more they got upset. So if there's some way to make the points, but make them simpler and clearer and shorter. I will work on that for a draft response. And some of that might be just breaking the um, proposed process, or the, or the process is a separate document yeah. and uh, then it doesn't quite seem as daunting. Right, because then it's about a page and a half. Um, versus the explanation and all the attached documents that we gave to the council. So I will do that. Um, okay, so I think I've got it. We'll put on for the next meeting a final vote on the process itself. Um, and all. I don't want to hold things up, so I really would love to know what other people are thinking. Are others ready to vote on that, those amendments to the process today? I can go through them again. Um, actually, I might be able to, do we know how to turn the screen on? Because I think I've now got the right set. I think I've got the right app on my computer now. It's not the Samsung 7 series. Uh, two. Um, you can. Do I have to be into the 
HDMI port? Because I'm not into that. No, I don't think so. I think you can do it from the... Uh, but I'm given the time constraints, fine, just yeah. read it. Yeah, so I will read them. In this, and there, all the changes are in the second paragraph of the proposed process. Um, the first one is to the very end of the first paragraph of that second paragraph where it says, and are necessary and obvious and that the planning board attempt to propose revisions to the master plan and vote to approve them within nine months instead of six months. And the second set of changes is three paragraphs later with the paragraph that begins, it is CRC's understanding that town staff has been compiling a list of potential revisions. The second sentence of that is, CRC's definition of necessary and obvious includes revisions such as those to reflect the change in the form of government, the council's adoption of climate action goals, and town adoption of plans and initiatives, including the transportation plan, updated flood mapping. The changes, we removed the phrase changes in town priorities since the approval of the master plan, removed the phrase in the parenthetical cl council climate action goals, because it got incorporated up to the top and got rid of the wording and goals um, since the only goal in that list was the climate action goal and so changed the wording to reflect that. Those are the only changes we discussed today. Um, so if we are ready to vote, our last vote on this was um, the vote was to recommend the council adopt the process outlined as its process for working toward adoption of the master plan is required by Charter Section 9.8. Um, so it would, the new motion, I guess, would be to recommend the council adopt the amended process or the process as amended below um, or as amended at the January 29th meeting. So moved. As its process. So, so moved. That. Okay, so there's a motion by Andy and a second by Pat, I believe. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. aye. So I see five votes in favor. That is a unanimous vote. I will send out the final process to you guys once I've put it into its own separate document and then I will write a, um, a memo and all. So with that, we are at 1030, um, so I will Yes, Mr. Hornick? I beg your indulgence, but I have one quick item. Uh, it is related to housing, but not anything we've been discussing before. About two days ago, I sent to all of you, as well as the rest of the town council, a note indicating that the housing trust had endorsed uh, or, or sent to or state representatives support for two bills that are before the legislature, one on right to counsel for people in eviction and the other on eviction ceiling. And the intention in my note, if it wasn't entirely clear for the town council to adopt also resolutions uh, favoring those two legislative actions and to let our two representatives, Mindy Dom and Joe Comerford, uh, know that you support that. Uh, I think that's an important thing to do. I uh, think that the five of you, when you take a look at it, if you haven't already, would certainly agree, perhaps particularly a former director of Western Mass Legal Services, who probably knows a lot more about these issues than I do. Uh, so I urge you to uh, push the larger council to put that on the agenda, if possible, at the next meeting and uh, adopt a resolution uh, supporting 
those two legislative initiatives. Thank you. you well, I, what I was going to, I was going to clarify, you said you sent an email to the whole council? Yeah. I yeah. am not in memory of that email. Could you resend that to the council? And I just checked my junk email, so really? <laughs> it didn't go there either. Um, okay. So if you could resend that, that I would be fantastic. It. Maybe I'll resend it individually because I use the yeah, town that... council address. Okay. Yes, Pat. I think we need to see it yes. first, right. Right. but yeah. I will keep that in mind as it, when we get copies of them. My apologies if it somehow didn't reach you. I will make my best effort to do that immediately. Thank you. I, and, and I am quite familiar with the right to counsel um, proposal. I've worked on that both on the national level and um, the state level, and I have had conversations with both our senator and representative about it as an individual, and uh, so I'm quite familiar. Yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with eviction ceiling as well. Yeah. So if you could send that off back to the council, since a number of us don't remember receiving it, that would be fantastic. Um, we are over our time. I'm going to postpone adoption of the minutes to the next meeting. Um, are there any items not anticipated by myself? Seeing none, we are going to adjourn at 1035. Thank you all. <laughs>